All right, here we are, uh, lesson number nine in our Isaiah series, the final lesson in the uh, series. The title of this lesson is The True Fast. And for those of you who like to follow along in your Bibles, I would encourage you to open uh, to Isaiah chapter 58, and we'll actually be going over uh, verses uh, one to 14. Well, um, I remember as a Catholic boy growing up uh, in uh, Catholic Quebec, uh, I would give up candy during Lent. You know, there was this season in the Catholic calendar called Lent and I would give up candy during this uh, period of uh, time. Now, Lent was a period of 40 days between Ash Wednesday and the eve of Easter Sunday. Uh, this year, for example, it uh, goes from uh, February 17th uh, to April uh, the 4th. Anyways, uh, these uh, 40 days commemorated the 40 days that Jesus spent in the desert fasting and praying, as well as the suffering that he would undergo before his, uh, before his resurrection. So uh, people uh, would uh, fast uh, during this period of time, uh, these 40 days. Uh, many folks uh, would give up smoking, for example. I remember in our family, you know, uh, my mother would smoke, my dad smoked, you know, and they, they would uh, give up uh, smoking for uh, that uh, period of time. Some people would give up uh, perhaps uh, eating meat uh, or other things. As a little kid, I would give up, uh, you know, having candy. Uh, the, the, the sad part, of course, uh, uh, was that many times folks would just go back to doing what they used to do uh, once uh, Easter Sunday. And so, of course, after Easter, uh, everyone would go back to their uh, normal routines. Although there were probably good intentions here, most folks, uh, and I remember watching this in my own family, missed the point about fasting and what God required from fasting. When we think of fasting, we usually think of food and perhaps going hungry, you know, just denying ourselves food for a time and kind of suffering hunger pangs. And although this may be true to an extent, the denial of food for a time is only a small part of what fasting is really all about. And so in chapter 58 of the book of Isaiah, the prophet explains to the Jews what God requires when they fast. And he explains to them what a true fast is really all about. And so in this chapter, Isaiah speaks about the Jews and their misunderstanding, not only about God's requirement for a fast, but also their ignorance concerning those things that really please uh, God. So if you're at Isaiah 58, we'll begin reading that. We're going to read through this whole passage, 1 to 14 here in our lesson this morning. So verse one, Isaiah writes, cry loudly, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. So this chapter begins as Isaiah quotes God as God is speaking directly to his people and he's telling them that they're sinners and that they, know, they need to know what their sins are about. You know, declare to my people their transgression. Now Isaiah has spoken repeatedly to the people about this, but they ignore him and they go about their religious practices without noticing him or his words against them. They just say, yeah, sure, talk to the hand, you know, I hear you. And they just keep on doing what they're doing. So in verse two he continues, yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways. And of course now he's writing as if God is speaking directly to the people. As a nation that has done, in righteous, uh, has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God, they ask me for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. And so despite this wickedness, God says 
that the people continually seek Him to reward them with spiritual blessings. In other words, they act just like a people who actually obey me. You know, he said, you, you people think you actually obey me and you're always asking me for favors. And he tells them, but you're not obeying me. You're just hypocrites. And you're worse than hypocrites. You're clueless. Basically, he's telling them, you, you don't have a clue of what pleases me. You keep reading in verse three, he says, why have we fasted and you do not see? So now Isaiah reverses it. Now it's like the people speaking back to God. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, now God is talking back to them, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. And so in this verse, God, you know, they're talking back and forth, but God is mocking them by repeating their own words to him as a kind of a dialogue. And in the discussion, they complain that they fast, and yet God doesn't reward them in the same way. And God answers that they fast externally, perhaps some sort of ceremonial fasting. But he says, their inner person is not changed at all. The proof is that they still treat others, their slaves, their workers, with contempt in the pursuit of personal profit. Verse four, behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. So God describes the results of their so-called fast and he tells them that it will not produce what they want. It won't reach heaven and their prayers will not be heard and it won't produce a more spiritual person. In fact, the way they do it only increases their wickedness in God's eyes. Imagine you're fasting, thinking you're pleasing God, and what you're doing, thinking you're pleasing God, actually angers Him. So in verse five, the question is raised, is it a fast like this which I choose? A day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? So, so God questions them on the externals that they meticulously followed in their fasting. Uh, to bow the head in prayer and humility, to dress humbly with rough garments and to sprinkle ashes on the head as a sign of sorrow for sin. Getting back to our Ash Wednesday uh, comment at the beginning, uh, one of the things that we did, uh, I remember as a young boy, is we went to Mass uh, Ash Wednesday uh, during that time of Lent. And on Ash Wednesday, we'd go forward and the, the priest uh, would have ashes or some kind of you know, substance and he would kind of put a, a little cross on our forehead, you know, signifying the ashes, the ashes of humility, of repentance, you know, uh, uh, mirroring what uh, the Jews did in the Old Testament, uh, sackcloth and, and they'd throw ashes in the air or they'd put ashes on their, on their head as a sign of humility. So this was the modern day symbolic way of, of, doing, of doing that. But anyways, as far as uh, Isaiah is concerned, God is saying to the Jews, these externals were to represent something that was real. They weren't just to be external. They were to represent a humble and a contrite heart because of sin or failure or trial and sorrow. A person like Job, for example, who was going through his trials. What did he do? He put ashes on his head. He, he wore rough clothing as, a, as a, a, a way to demonstrate his suffering and his, his sorrow. Uh, and this is what God is saying. Is that, is that why you're doing it? Because this type of 
external appearance signified a person's need for God and, and God's salvation. And so in the following verses, God will describe not just the ceremonial fasting that represented a contrite heart, but he'll also describe those actions which proved that the fasting was actually sincere. And so he mentions three things that were directed towards the people of Isaiah's day, but can also be applied to every generation of God's people who seek a true fast before the Lord. And there are times when we want to do that, isn't there? I mean, there are times that I've certainly wanted to do that. Times of difficulty, times of testing, times of illness, times of, uh, wow, how did I get here type uh, situation. Times of illness that won't go away. Time, times of illness where you don't know what the illness is. Like you don't know what you got. Where you just want to humble yourself before God. You know, get smaller before God in humility, in asking Him to, to help you. And, and God is saying to the people, He said, is this, is this the attitude that you're having? It, 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 all of this external stuff, is, is this you know, representing how you feel on the inside? So in the verses to follow, he describes the rewards that come with a true fast. And the first external sign of a true fast, he says, is mercy. And we read in verse six to nine, God says through his prophet, is this not the fast which I choose? to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and He will say, here I am. And so a true fast will produce godly qualities like mercy that in Jewish society showed itself in the freeing of those who were enslaved in one way or another through indebtedness or whatever, freeing those people or caring for those who were in physical need, the hungry and the naked, the poor, and the support of one's own family when he says, you know, your own flesh, meaning are you taking care of your own family, let alone strangers or the poor or your employees? And this quality will, reward, will be rewarded, he says. Mercy will provide a great witness of your faith. There's a reward to go to bed at night with the thought and the knowledge and the confidence that your faith is actually sincere, that your faith is genuine. And also that God promises to heal the sadness of the soul Today we call it depression or anxiety. You know, mercy, many times, the act of mercy or the developing of, merc of a merciful spirit is the antidote to depression, to sadness. And then the merciful become acceptable to God. This is how they share His glory. And their prayers will be answered, God says. And so a true fast produces a merciful and a compassionate heart, which God rewards in a variety of ways. That's one of the things that a true fast will produce. Another thing that true fasting produces is truth. 
we continue to read verse 9b and all, all the way to 12. God still speaking. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones. And you will be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters uh, do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And so a sign that one's heart is turning towards God is a greater desire to be truthful. One begins speaking with the purpose of healing and nourishing others. What's understood here is that the speaking of the truth in love, this is what nourishes the hungry soul. The Jews hated the Gentiles and they hated anyone not in their social class. Many times those not even in their family you know, were considered less. They were originally chosen by God to speak the truth to the Gentiles and live as a light to them. The Jews of Isaiah's time had failed miserably in this. A true fast would see this truthful attitude towards others returning and rewarded. And so speaking the truth in this way would do several things. It would restore their nation. Their nation would be restored to greatness and not degraded and, and threatened as they were in Isaiah's day. You know, they, the time of Solomon, they, it was a golden period, the vast wealth and the power and the armies that they had, prestige among the other nations. Imagine the other nations were sending delegations of their diplomats and so on and so forth to sit at the feet of Solomon for wisdom about all matters. And they would bring gold and silver and all kinds of precious things to, to, to Israel, to, to Israel's king, because of the wisdom that he had and the, and the grandness of, of the kingdom. But that was not the condition of the southern kingdom in the time of Isaiah had been reduced to just this small little weak little nation. You know, we, we should take note of that. Even our nation is not what it used to be. Even our nation is not seen in the same light as it used to be, not too long ago. He also says that as a people, they would experience peace and joy in the Lord. And their generation would be remembered as the one that rebuilt the nation and returned it to faith in the Lord. That's if they spoke the truth. A true fast, he says, produces clarity of vision and ability to know and tell the truth, which is the first criterion for personal or national greatness. I mean, if you permit me to say, don't ask why America is in crisis. The people no longer trust their leaders or those who speak for them, the media, to tell the truth anymore. Isn't that the biggest problem? I mean, poll after poll after poll says that the the people don't trust their leaders and they don't trust the people who are supposed to speak to them the truth about what is taking place even in their own nation. Can't go very far with an untrusting population. And then he says, a true fast will produce holiness in a people. Verse 13 and 14, he says, if because of the Sabbath, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day 
and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from speaking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word. Then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so in that day, to truly keep the Sabbath meant that the individual sincerely gave himself over to the worship of the Lord on that day. The idea was to rest from worldly activity in order to spend the day with the Lord. The Jews, however, created all kinds of loopholes to permit Sabbath keeping, but to still do what they wanted to do on the Sabbath. And much of what they wanted to do was sinful, even on the Sabbath day. You know, it's like, uh, making sure the nightclubs are open on Sunday, you know, that type of thing. A true fast, however, would produce a sincere and acceptable worship. And this in turn would be blessed by the Lord in a variety of ways. And he mentions that. They would receive the blessings of worship. They would actually get something out of their worship. They would actually get to know the Lord and experience Him and delight in their fellowship with Him. I mean, think about, he's trying to give them one day a week where they can spend time with him, get to know him, get a taste, just a taste of the Spirit. Because if they get a taste of the Spirit, a taste of the Lord, then that reality will override all other things. They won't want any other thing if they can just get a taste of him. And their worship also would yield wisdom to know how to live a godlier life. You know, the idea of a vision of a higher place that he talks about, meaning the vision, the ability to see what it's like to live a higher life, a more spiritually filled life. And God would feed them, in other words, would satisfy them with the promise of a savior I mean, this was their heritage from Jacob. You know, when he says, I'll satisfy you with the heritage from Jacob. What was the heritage from Jacob? Well, a promise that one day, you know, the Savior would come. And he says, if you do these things, I will make sure that that promise is you know, steady in your hearts. You'll have hope. You know, when a person loses hope, or even when a nation loses hope, the next step after that is despair. And so a true fast draws one nearer to God. And from that fellowship comes the taste of eternal life with God and the courage to live faithfully until that time comes. So if we were to read on, we would see that despite this admonition to offer God a true and a sincere fast, the Jews continued their hypocrisy and they were eventually crushed and they were taken into captivity by the Babylonian army. You, you have to understand uh, that the Jewish people uh, at that time felt that they were invincible. Here they were, this little tiny country and they had these massive world powers to the north and the south of them. And they thought, no way that, that will ever happen to us. No way will we ever be taken. Our position is secure. We're the people of God. Just like we in our nation say, no way, we'll never be taken over. Are you kidding me? We're the, we're the United States of America. We have the strongest military. We have the most powerful you know, economy. There's no way anybody would overtake us. Well, they had the exact same, different reason, but the exact same attitude. And not too long after this, you know, they were in chains in, in Babylon. So although it was written centuries ago to a people whose culture and history is very different from ours, Isaiah's admonition fits our modern situation today. 
In many ways we play the same game with our religion while God waits for us to offer Him a true fast so He can, so he can bless us. He doesn't want us to have a true fast so that we can suffer somehow. He wants to bless us. Haven't you ever had that experience with your children? <laughs> if you finish your homework, I got something special for you, really special, you know, just finish your homework, you know. And she or he you know, will dawdle around with the pencil and they'll look up in the air and whine and moan and you know, complain and do everything under the sun to avoid doing the chore, whatever it is. You know, and there you have, you've got, you know, I don't know what, tickets to Frontier City. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? You've got a good thing. And you, you can't go back on your word, you've said it, you've got to do that first and then we're going to do the thing that I've got for you. Well, this is the same thing. God is saying, I have blessings for you. If you just would be you know, sincere and merciful and truthful. Now, when I say the same game, by game, I mean that we, today, we play at church many times. We go through the motions as Christians, but God still requires proof of inward change. I think we forget that God is, uh, we know He's omnipotent, uh, but we, we forget that He's also everywhere. And so He's not just contained here in the building. He sees us here, but He also sees us you know, at the casino. <laughs> yeah, he accompanies us there as well. He knows our life. He knows what we do. He still wants to see mercy. Is our faith making us more merciful? Are we more forgiving, more tolerant, more willing to not take offense? Has anyone been on the receiving end of our mercy lately? Unfortunately, half the work in the church from the elders' perspective, ministers' perspective, half of the work, you know, and this is speaking from you know, 40 years of experience plus, half the work in the church is calming people down because they've been upset or offended at something that someone else said or did. <laughs> They're ready to quit. They're ready to quit the church. They're ready to quit the Lord because they got their feathers ruffled somehow for some reason or other. A little more time focused on the cross, a little less time focused on our feelings would cultivate mercy, mercy in our hearts. God still wants to see truth. I've calculated that since I've been here, February 2010 is when I came back, between Marty and I, we've taught over 220 sermons. I mean, I think even more than that, but about that many. We've taught 2,000 Bible classes and we've done countless devotionals, personal studies. I'm thinking that by now most of us should know the truth because we've certainly been taught it over and over and over again. The question is, has anyone heard or seen the truth coming from you? Knowing it is not enough. Sharing it is what pleases the Lord. And God still wants to see Holiness, is our uh, uh, religion some uh, clean shirt or dress we put on for church and then we leave in the closet for work and for leisure? The Jews were the light unto the Gentiles in the same way that Jesus says we are the light unto the world. The question is, has our religious experience led us to be lights at work, at school, or other places. If it hasn't, then either our religion is wrong or we're not practicing it correctly. You know, when I was in college, my preaching professor emphasized the idea that in preaching or teaching, sooner or later you have to get to the point because some ministers tend to preach on and on, but they never kind of get to it. You know, the audience is there, they're with you, but they're saying, What's he saying? Do you know what he's saying? Is, is he ever going to get to it? I, I don't want to make this mistake, so here's the point. Let's not forget what our religion is about. The true fast that Isaiah talked about 
was the sincere expression of religion, not just the externals of religion. Religious people then and now have to always be careful to remember what their religion is about. In Isaiah's you know, book, God reminded the Jews and by extension, He reminds us that our religion, I know you're going to get tired of seeing it, our, our religion is about mercy. It's about showing mercy to others in big and little ways, just as Christ shows mercy to us in big and little ways. Sometimes you know, we just have to let stuff go by. You know, we just have to let it go by. Not make a big deal out of it. Say to ourselves, well, that brother, those brethren, you know, whether you've been hurt by one or by a group, you know, I forgive them, I'm, I'm going to go on. And our religion is about truth, our sharing the truth with those outside the church building, not just hearing the truth produced to us or preached to us twice a week. I mean, my task is to, to teach the class so that you can teach other people, not so that you can judge how good or enjoyable you know, my lessons are. I'm happy if you enjoy the lessons, that's great. You know, that's a good affirmation. But I'm wanting it to get out of here into the world through you. And then it's about holiness. God wants us to be holy, not just act holy. If you don't like being holy, meaning if you don't love purity and goodness and sincerity, then you won't, you won't like being in heaven because there's no sin there. There's only holiness there. If you don't like holiness down here, well then you know, you're not going to like heaven. To be a religious person, you must not be ashamed of your holiness because that's what separates you from the world. I'm telling you, at any, any time in your life, and perhaps more times than one, the moment will come when you will have to say to someone else, yeah, you guys go ahead, or you, you, you go ahead, I'm, yeah, I don't do that, I'm sorry, I just don't want to do that. You know. Why, why don't you want, nah, it's okay, no, don't. But the reason you don't want to do that, the reason you don't want to participate in that, the reason that you're pulling back from that is because it's not a holy thing that these people are going to do. It's not a holy place that these people are going to go. You're not willing to compromise your holiness simply to fit in for a moment or with certain, certain people. And that's, that's pretty difficult. Some Christians are embarrassed by their holiness because they still want to be accepted by the world. But you can't have it both ways. Either you belong to Christ or you don't. You can fool the world, you can fool the church, but you certainly can't fool the Lord. And He's the one who's going to judge us. So as I close the lesson, the series, I, I want each person here, young and old, new Christian, experienced saint, to ask yourself is, if Isaiah's words are for you personally. I know that it isn't for everybody because there are many who know what a true fast is. There are many here who understand what Christianity is all about and they're living their lives in a pleasing way before the Lord and being blessed for it. They have a peaceful heart, they possess a joyful attitude and hope for the future and they enjoy fruitful service to the Lord by service and support of His church. But on the other hand, if this lesson is speaking to you, challenging your ways, then don't be like the Jews who heard Isaiah's message, but they ignored it. Do something to respond to God's admonition. Get on your knees at home and call on Him for help. Begin living your life in the way that you know God wants you to live your life. Obey the gospel if you need to, or be reconciled to the Lord or to His church if you need to. Let's make sure that our religion is not just on the outside. Let's be absolutely sure that it's on the inside as well. Then and only then will it really make its way to the outside of our character and out into the community and the world 
where it will glorify God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, that's the end of our series on Isaiah. Certainly there are many more wonderful lessons that could be drawn from this amazing book, but at least we've had a sampling of these in our brief series uh, on uh, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah for uh, Beginners. So I thank you for your attention and your patience and I pray that God bless you. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll meet back here in just a little while for our worship service. Thank you very much.